You're listening to a Roddenberry podcast. Don't touch that dial. We'll be right back. We'll have more news this evening, but first, the latest genealogy, a Roddenberry podcast. Episode 33, Helen of Abijanian. Welcome to Mission Log Genealogy. I'm Earl Green. And I'm Norman Lau. Each week on Genealogy, we go stomping through the Roddenberry archives, digging up Gene Roddenberry's early TV writing in the years before he created Star Trek. But we don't just drink it all in. We examine it to see how it compares to his later works and what he was saying in these early works. This week we've got a date with Helen of Abijanian, one of Gene's most celebrated episodes of the classic western, Have Gun, Will Travel. Earl will be back with trivia in a moment, but first, here's how you can reach us. Genealogy is meant to be entertaining and informative, but it's also the beginning of an ongoing conversation about the works of Gene Roddenberry. Drop us a line at missionlog at roddenberry.com and join us on X and Facebook at Mission Log Pod. While you're at it, leave us a review and a rating at Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast platform. And please remember, your comments could be used on future installments of Genealogy. And now here's Earl Green with this week's trivia. You did a great job with the segue there, Norm. Thank you. I'm going to do something a little unusual with trivia this week. We are going to talk about things other than the cast's credentials. Don't get me wrong, they are all on point. But there is some really interesting behind-the-scenes stuff with this episode, and in order to not let the trivia segment take over the whole show, that's what I'm choosing to focus on this week. We're halfway through a solid month of consecutive episodes of Have Gun, Will Travel written by Gene, a streak that began with the Yuma Treasure and would continue for another week after this episode aired. Helen of Abishanian premiered on December 28, 1957, right between Christmas and New Year's, a good place for a more light-hearted episode. And a good place for an award-winning episode as well. This script netted Gene an award for the best original teleplay from the Writers Guild of America in 1958, something which probably helped both the series' reputation among writers and made for a nice line on Gene's resume. As we noted last week, it's still early days for Have Gun, Will Travel, and as with any long-running show's first season on the air, the elements that audiences learned to take for granted later were still in the process of taking shape. Case in point, this episode marks the first appearance of Johnny Western's song The Ballad of Paladin over the end credits. The night without armor in a savage land has arrived. The story of how this song came to be part of the show's history is one of those Hollywood Cinderella stories that almost seems hard to believe by today's standard. Johnny Western was the pen name of musician and occasional actor Johnny Westerland, who had guest starred on a prior produced episode of Have Gun and loved the experience. He wrote and recorded the song as a gift to Richard Boone, but Boone and Have Gun's co-creator, Sam Rolfe, loved the song so much that they wanted to use it over the end credits. Boone and Rolfe both made tweaks to the lyrics and wound up with co-writing credits on the song, and Boone exercised his clout as the show's star to bulldoze any discussion at the studio of having someone other than Johnny Western record his own song. There were cover versions, including one by the late Dwayne Eddy, whose recent New York Times obituary incorrectly credited him as the creator of the song, but Western himself sang and played the broadcast version, and when you multiply those royalties by the number of episodes, and the number of times those episodes have been repeated over nearly seven decades, Boone's influence meant that Johnny Western made an entire living, plus a kind of perpetual annuity, from this one song. And I'm sure the song's evergreen success also benefited Boone himself, along with Sam Rolfe, once they dropped in on the writing credits. By insisting that the song's writer would also be its performer, Boone completely transformed Johnny Western's career. Johnny joined the likes of Gene Autry and Johnny Cash on stage, in fact, he was part of Johnny Cash's touring band for nearly 40 years. Johnny Western and Johnny Cash were asked to rework the lyrics for the theme of Bonanza as well. Pile on some more royalties there. But bringing this back to Have Gun, Will Travel, here's the thing. 
The episodes were not aired in the order they were shot, so Johnny Western's song appeared for the first time at the end of this episode, long before Johnny himself appeared in a one-off guest shot in 1958. Of course, it certainly didn't hurt Johnny Western's publishing royalties, but the Ballad of Paladin became a frequently quoted touchstone of 50s pop culture. In addition to the pile of cover versions that quickly followed the original, it's been sung or played in other shows and movies. Stand By Me, Family Guy, Riverdale, The Last Thing He Wanted, and that's naming just a few. So it just seemed right to focus this week's trivia on the beginning of the story of the song in the end credits. At the Hotel Carlton in San Francisco, Paladin is relaxing in his off-duty finery, reading a newspaper article about an Armenian family's wine festival that has been cancelled because their daughter, who was set to be the festival's dancing girl, has eloped with a passing cowboy. The article mentions that her father is offering a $1,000 reward for her return, but as she is not a minor, local law enforcement has no legal standing to stop her. Hey Boy checks in with Paladin, thinking of leaving again so soon. Turns out Paladin has a thing for Armenian cooking, so he is indeed going to set out and take this case, and he mails his card to the missing girl's father, Samuel Abijanian, before he leaves. Paladin arrives on horseback at the Armenian winery, and he isn't exactly greeted warmly. Then again, Samuel Abijanian is in a foul mood, and seems determined to make sure the rest of the world knows it. Paladin listens to Samuel go off, about the dishonorable man who lured his daughter away and lays out his terms. He'll make every attempt to bring the girl back, but he expects to be paid whether or not he succeeds. But Samuel doesn't just want his daughter back. He wants her suitor brought back, too, and there's gonna be a wedding before it's all over. It's a matter of honor. Amused, Paladin enters a negotiation with Samuel, and after several lowball offers from the self-proclaimed poor Armenian farmer... The original price of $1,000 is agreed to. And with that, Paladin is finally off on his assignment. Act 2. Paladin rides day and night in his search for the missing couple who have two days' head start on him. But there's a catch. No one said this is an especially happy couple. Jimmy O'Reilly, the young man who is said to have absconded with the young lady, is actually trying to outrun her. She is the one pursuing him and Jimmy's not ready to be caught or ready to commit to anybody. But Helen Abijanian is head over heels, moon-eyed in love. As they argue it out while giving their horses a rest, that's when Paladin rides into the scene, announcing that Helen's father hired him to bring her back. And boy, is that welcome news to Jimmy O'Reilly. But not so fast. Paladin makes it clear that Jimmy's coming back, too, with an invitation to his own wedding. At that news, Helen quietly smiles. Jimmy moves his hand toward his gun, only to find that Paladin has already drawn down on him. Paladin advises him to think twice about it. Besides, he'd rather conduct this negotiation over food than over weapons. Around the campfire, Paladin is just as amused as he was at Samuel's vineyard. Jimmy clearly has a great deal of affection for Helen, no matter how much he tries to deny it. But Paladin keeps cornering him in the conversation, and when Jimmy decides he's going to make a real fight out of it, Paladin knocks him down with a single punch. Jimmy finally admits he's beaten. He'll go back, but he's not making any long-term promises beyond that. As he tells both Paladin and Helen, you could take a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. The next day, everyone has returned to Samuel as promised, but Jimmy's still not in a cooperative mood. He even challenges Samuel's abilities as a farmer. Why isn't he running cattle on some of the acreage and earning money that way? If Samuel is Jimmy's future father-in-law, he is certainly not establishing peaceful family ties. Finally, Samuel's had enough. He challenges Jimmy to a duel, an arm-wrestling duel. But as Paladin points out, this is Armenian arm-wrestling. Hot coals await the back of the hand of whoever loses. Jimmy is told that he can give up the game at any time. All he has to do is let go of Samuel's hand. But if Jimmy and Samuel do have anything in common, it's bullheaded stubbornness. Each man manages to give the other's hand at least a glancing burn on the hot coals. Paladin calls it a draw before anyone can really get hurt. 
Jimmy sits in a wash tub, cleaning up in preparation for the wedding, protesting all the while that you can lead a horse to water, but... And that's Paladin's cue to dump another bucket of water over Jimmy's head. Jimmy is outraged. He has never taken a bath in the middle of the week. Paladin starts quoting some poetry at Jimmy every time he opens his mouth to complain, and it's clear that he's greatly amused at Jimmy's discomfort. Act 3 Evening grows near. Jimmy, now cleaned up, dried off, and dressed up, stands off to one side as the preparations are made. Fine Armenian cuisine, music, and, of course, plenty of wine. When Paladin urges him to try the food, Jimmy says he's not going to be staying for the ceremony. Paladin points out that an intelligent man wouldn't ride off into the night on an empty stomach. But if Jimmy insists, it's not as if he's being kept here as a prisoner. Besides, Paladin is sure that Jimmy wouldn't be able to handle the traditional dance that the bride does. Jimmy, getting ready to stuff his face, is sure that a mere dance won't sway him one way or the other. Paladin just stands back, shish kebab in hand, and laughs. Over dinner, Jimmy just keeps talking himself into a corner while he's trying to talk himself out of the whole thing, as Paladin keeps chuckling to himself. In reality, Paladin is just trying to keep Jimmy around long enough to see Helen dance, and there she is, and she's kind of hard to ignore. Jimmy is entranced. Paladin and Samuel sit on either side of him, joking about the number of times Jimmy has tried to leave, but hasn't quite left. As Jimmy continues to be transfixed by Helen's dance, what starts out as a casual conversation turns into Paladin shaming Samuel Abijanian into providing the young couple with a sufficient dowry, as per Armenian tradition. Basically, he finally talks Samuel into setting them up with their own farm and their own portion of the vineyard. And when the time comes, Samuel summons a couple of his farmhands to make sure that Jimmy joins his bride. But that won't be necessary. He goes willingly. The End the best thing about your recap, Earl, is that I didn't have to haggle you for, I don't know, an additional minute. I'm just a, you know, I'm just a poor podcaster, and I couldn't afford an additional minute or two. But I think that your explanation for the, the time that you needed, I can accept those terms. Well, the good news is when I hit play on the episode, I was just standing there staring at it unquestioningly. <sighs> We have a lot to talk about here, but this is not your typical Western episode. This is fall-down funny. This is a comedy episode, and I have no notes. I have no notes. I have lots of notes, but as far as any changes I would make to it, I can't come up with a whole lot. It's interesting you say that, because it brings up a, a point that you made about Gene and how incredibly good he can be at comedy without purposefully being good at comedy. You know what I mean? Everything in this, in this episode in kind of like a dramatic series, you know, presentation, it could have gone one way, but I think that there's just this particular chemistry that happened in this episode from Gene's writing, uh, you know, to the directing, to the casting, just to the performances and maybe that's why it, it garnered, you know, the award that it did, because very seldomly do you see episodes that just click at every level, every, every opportunity. And this one just did. It was just special. I think it's the best way I could say it, you know? And none of it feels forced. No, none. It all feels very natural. And I have so many questions about what inspiration Gene drew on for some very specific scenes in this show. Mm -hmm. However, before we get started there, I have to point out that in chronological broadcast order of just viewing only Gene's Have Gun, Will Travel episodes, this is the first time we have seen Hey Boy. Mm -hmm. And as someone who watched a lot of this show in reruns at a very young age, and that included both Gene's episodes and everyone else's, I felt like a piece of the puzzle that I was missing in the previous episodes kind of clicked into place here with just that short appearance. I realize that this is a character that can be viewed as problematic, but I also feel like there are some positives here. Uh, I can cringe a little bit that he is in a position of constantly having to defer to Paladin, but... 
paladin does not condescend in any way. They have a very easy rapport. They've obviously known each other a long time. It's almost one of those relationships where nothing even needs to be said. They understand each other immediately. Paladin hands Hayboy what would have been considered large notes in the day, tells him to keep the change, so obviously he thinks very highly of him. They each need the other there. So it really is, you know, Paladin treats him as as close to an equal as that relationship will allow, I, I think is the best way I can put it. So probably not an Uhura-level breakthrough for any kind of equality, but from my admittedly limited viewpoint, I really enjoyed seeing the character and the actor, and it, it always feels like he is part of the complete tapestry of the show, like it's not complete without him putting in at least a short appearance. Yeah, I totally agree. This is what episode... 15? 15 or uh, 16 of the first season. 15, right. And uh, Cam Tong, who plays Hey Boy, he was there at the very first episode, Three Bells to Perdido. Yeah, he was in the pilot. And you're right. There's something very just interesting and special about Hey Boy. You can take issue like with the his name or his you know nickname or moniker. But I agree with everything that you said about how Paladin approaches Hey Boy from a symbiotic point of view, right? Uh, hey Boy is very much, uh, for all of you superhero fans out there, he's very much, say, Alfred, you know, to Paladin's Bruce Wayne. You know, he's there to make sure that Paladin's affairs are in order. He gives him his, like, usually, you know, traditionally, uh, Hey Boy at the Carlton Hotel, uh, which is a, a posh hotel. You know, I'm sure Paladin probably spoke on Hey Boy's behalf to get him the position that he has there in San Francisco, and he takes care of his mail. He takes care of his dry cleaning. He takes care of his tickets. Uh, he takes care of all of the gentlemanly affairs when Paladin is off doing what he does, you know, for his calling cards, you know, with uh, all of the different jobs that he does. So I like that there is kind of like the the refinement of a, a Hey Boy character and not the kind of character that you would have seen in like, you know, Mickey Rooney's Breakfast at Tiffany's, right? Which is probably like the most deplorable version of an Asian character that wasn't even portrayed by an Asian. At least Cam Tong was Chinese, <laughs> right? So, you know, at least there there is that. I think the only thing disparaging, looking at it from a 2024 standpoint, is the hey boy or kind of like boy or, you know, uh, might as well call him a garçon, you know, if you will. But at least the agency of the character is still there. And I think that's worth, um, that's worth a positive note for sure. Yeah, and... You do bring up a good point. They actually went for authentic casting at a time when that was very seldom a concern. Because I think we've already pinged this show a few points in the past for casting various flavors of Caucasian as Native Americans. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it's not a great look in hindsight, but it was very much how this stuff was made back then. But it's interesting that in the case of this character, they decided, no, we have to actually find someone who is, you know, close close enough for jazz, ethnicity-wise, to play this character on a consistent basis. And I'm sure some of that is, we don't have to make him up to look like someone he's not which right. they would have done if they had hired some white guy to play this character, which... Yeah, that, that's fair. It, it's a relief that they didn't go that route. But like I said, he's he's so much part of my memory of the show. Upon spotting him at the beginning of this episode, I was like, ah, there he is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Richard Boone is having a really good time on this show, on this episode. It is visible on screen he is having fun playing the comedy of it and not just being, you know, this steady, monotone, tough guy. I have a feeling this is why he liked Gene's scripts. Because no two of them have been alike. 
we are on the fourth script Gene has written for the show, it, just in terms of broadcast order. And we are really getting Paladin as a fully rounded human being here. And mm -hmm. one with a great sense of humor in this episode. Well, I think that there is a huge distinction, you know, in the Paladin character of, I know a job that's going to be incredibly risky. And I know a job that is going to be, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a job that pays the bills, right? And of course, at the very beginning, he has such affection for the Armenian people. He is talking about the food. He's talking about the culture. He's talking about so many aspects uh, that set the stage for walking into a situation that he doesn't feel completely defensive about, you know, or on edge. Uh, and I think that just, it, it lends to kind of like the ease of the story and taking a lot of just kind of like the, the immediate threat and drama out of, out of the story and about just enjoying the performances. Like you said, I loved at the beginning how he used this little bitty pocket knife pulled from his waistcoat that he uses to slice the article that he read about um, Samuel Abijanian to mail with his card, you know, to um, to let him know that he's coming to solve his problem. I thought that was really super cool. And it just, it's very old fashioned. Uh, speaking of old fashioned, I love the old grades stomping, you know, scene with all of Samuel's daughters, no sons, just daughters stomping the grapes. But there is something that you and I like particularly loved. And that was the scene between Paladin and Abijanian haggling for Paladin's fee and then going off the rails and coming back to the agreed upon fee. I thought that was one of the best bits of writing I've seen in a long time. I, I know that you felt like the similar to about it, you know, similar about it. Well, it it's funny because we go off into the weeds with all of this. I'm just a poor farmer. I, I can't afford the thousand dollars, even though the newspaper article already said, you know, and I'm, <laughs> yeah, if I had been Paladin, you know, I would have been like uh, clipping from the newspaper. Hello. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I also think that uh, if you if you pay attention and uh, it, over the repeated viewings that we've done, I, I mean, like out there, you know, with, with the uh, viewing audience, because you can watch these now, uh, either streaming, you know, or on YouTube or on DVD. Take a look at Richard Boone's performance in this like negotiation scene. He's literally on the verge, I think, of breaking a couple of times, at least. And, you know, film is money, so you can't afford, you know, to reshoot all the time. So I just thought it was kind of neat. You can really tell that uh, Richard Boone is, is having a good time uh, in the performance. But I also love kind of like these, they're quick, but they're poignant moments in dialogue. When Paladin rides up on Jimmy and, and uh, Helen, he says... He'd much rather talk over food than guns. I mean, that's that's very Gene, you know, and I love it when Gene slips in like these consistent breadcrumbs, these character moments that that give you just a, a more well-rounded look at who Paladin is. Like, I don't want to hurt anyone unless I have to. I'm going to hurt your food stores, but I'm not going to do you any physical harm. Let's let's drink. Let's eat. Let's figure this out. No one's going to get hurt. I'm almost surprised that by the end of it, Paladin's going to charge for this because I almost get the impression he went for the food. It's like he went to one of those um, those meat palaces and he just flipped over, you know, the, uh, what is it, like the, 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 the go button and says, okay, just keep serving the shish kebab. I'm fine here. Yeah, and it's on fire. Mm-hmm. There is a line that Jimmy O'Reilly says, and I am still trying to decide, Norm, if this is one of the silliest lines I've ever heard or one of the best. And especially given some of the weather I've been dealing with recently in my part of the country, there's a tornado inside me, and if it gets loose, it might tear both of us apart. And you know, <laughs> this is said with so much <laughs> intensity that I both understood it and cracked up because we established it very early. Jimmy is not exactly a, a tough guy. He might be a competent ranch hand, 
but he's not a tough guy. Uh, Paladin throws a very mild punch and floors the kid. Mm-hmm. I mean, that that is not a haymaker punch. That is a tap. I think that, you know, a line like that and a lot of, say, the poetry that Paladin kind of showers on Jimmy when they're trying to prepare him for his wedding. Jimmy has basically the textbook version of romance, but he doesn't understand romance, right? He, so he's trying to... He's trying to avail himself of like this passion that's going to just, you know, it's going to immolate the both of them because it, it's so torrid. But that's something maybe he heard from, I don't know, uh, um, uh, a poetry book, you know, or Shakespeare or something. Right. So he doesn't know what he's really saying. He just doesn't understand how to say it or why to say it. But he's trying to do the best that he can because his emotions are all over the place. Right. Now, one of my few, this is about as close as I get to a complaint with this episode of the accents kind of threaten to veer into Yakov Smirnoff territory just a little bit. Or, or if anyone remembers this from the beginning of 2010, the year we make contact, uh, Dana Elkar trying to be Russian, you know, talking to Roy Scheider in that scene. It's kind of a stock Russian accent that you get from watching other actors do Russian accents and not from ever having spoken to an actual Russian in person before. It's, right. It, right. It's a little... Yeah. It, it's not enough to really diminish my enjoyment of the episode, but it really stuck out at me as, eh, not great accent work there. But are you telling me that Sean Connery in Red October doesn't speak actual Russian? Yeah, you know, it doesn't, no? Yeah, okay. No, sorry, sorry. All right, that's not, then I have to you know, erase that from my whole memory then. The arm wrestling with hot coals. I, I don't know if this is actually an, an Armenian tradition. I don't know enough about the culture here. But uh, would you say that that kind of arm wrestling norm is over the top hey uh, well and you know cue the frank stallone music i mean you know samuel abajanian he's the best around and nothing's ever going to keep him down <laughs> exactly exactly it, now the other thing that kind of made me raise an eyebrow is that paladin grabs the wine you know once each of these men has kind of nicked the other guy's hand against the hot coals Paladin grabs the wine and pours some of it over both of their burned hands. I, I, is this just because it's cool? Is he counting on whatever alcohol content is in there to have any kind of antiseptic property? I'm just, I'm not sure that really holds up as a proper medical procedure there. Are we looking at the very first traceable DNA of Romulan ale in Gene stories? That's a good question. Of course, I haven't tried pouring that on my hands either. I uh, refrain from that comment. <laughs> Paladin, um, as I said before at the beginning of the episode, he has a he's he's very affectionate uh, towards the Armenian culture. I mean, to the point where two times, you know, he's been able to kind of shame Samuel uh, Avijanian into negotiating uh, either fairly or unfairly depends on which side of the coin you're on. But I do love how masterful both Paladin and Richard Boone's performance. Uh, they both are in these negotiations to understand the pride and kind of like the, the cultural history of, of coming to their, their village or their, uh, their winery and treating Samuel Abijanian with the respect that is due him, even though that he knows he's going to get the upper hand in the negotiations, he knows well enough to respect the the patriarchy of that culture. And I thought that was really smart on Gene's um, on Gene's dealing, you know, with the writing. There was no way Paladin was not going to come out on top of that negotiation, but like you said, it was all conducted with the utmost respect both man to man and culturally but it's is really interesting that 
Paladin has all of this experience. And, and yes, he may be there for the food, but his knowledge is vital to how he conducts himself and how he swings the entire situation around so that it is favorable for everybody. Because it, one thing that the scene where, you know, they're arguing over why isn't Samuel running cattle on his land. It, Samuel does need some outside perspective that Jimmy can provide. And Paladin recognizes this, but also some of Samuel's farmhands recognize this as well. And, you know, they try to get in and say, hey, the kid might be right, and get shouted down. And Paladin knows he's not going to get that treatment. Now, I love the scene with the dance. Okay, so a couple of points. It, and we were talking about this off mic before we recorded. There are numerous sources, both in print and online, that claim that this is, you know, for all intents and purposes, the same dance as Vina does in the cage. That's not in any way accurate. The dance that Vina does in the cage, you could not have gotten on American TV in 1957. I'm just going to say that flat out. Uh, standards loosened up a bit. What you could put on the air loosened up a lot between Helen of Abishanian and the cage. So anytime you see that, it's almost one of those things where it's like, tell me you haven't watched the episode without saying you haven't watched the episode. The great thing about Have Gun is it's available so many places. Really, I, I strongly urge everyone listening, go check this episode out. If this is the only one you check out from this first batch, this first season of, you know, five Gene episodes in the first season, if you're only going to watch one, watch this one. Or better yet, watch all of them. But I really like this one because there is so much masterful comic timing going on with all of the all of the haggling there's also just some great interplay some intercutting we don't see much of the dance itself we're we're not treated to that spectacle it's left to our imagination what it is that jimmy is seeing that's just leaving him his head at that angle like a curious puppy like i have no idea what i'm seeing but i like it but we divert from the dance. What we are seeing instead of the dance is this verbal dance going on between Paladin and Samuel Abijanian. Paladin's function in this episode, and you could argue this is the function in the whole show, he is ensuring that everyone behaves honorably. So yes, Jimmy, you are coming back and you are getting married. And yes, Samuel, you are going to provide the happy couple with a dowry. And granted, ensuring honorable behavior on everyone's part is also what was done with Billy Joe Kane and with Nathaniel Beecher. But I like that Paladin finds a way to do this in... I guess you could say this is a lower stakes situation. I'm not sure Samuel would feel that way. But it's not a life or death situation. No one's about to start shooting. And making sure that everyone is behaving on their is on their best behavior shall we say this is who paladin is and what paladin does all right norman we we've been debating off mic is is this discussion or is it more observations cuz i'm starting to think it's kind of like that cereal box it's oops it's all <laughs> observations because there's not a whole lot to really discuss here. It's not a tremendously deep story. We are not doing life or death this week. It's really interesting because the episode that was nominally the Christmas episode, mm -hmm. that was really heavy. But here we are on the week between Christmas and New Year's, 1957. And it's like the showrunners and CBS have decided they don't want anything very heavy story-wise during the holiday season. But four days before Christmas, that was fine. You know, guns and nooses and and just horrible things happening. 
you know, as any good journeyman TV writer will do, Gene delivers whatever they need. So in the course of this episode, one gun is drawn for maybe a whole minute. And one very light punch is thrown here. It doesn't doesn't take a lot to take Jimmy down. I'm just going to put it that way. Sorry, Jimmy. That's this episode's whole concession to the basic contours of the American television western. And this is where I feel like we are finding out why Gene was specifically invited to contribute to Have Gun, Will Travel. Because Rolf and Meadows wanted to differentiate it from other westerns that were crowding out the primetime schedule. And this is exactly the sort of story that they would want when handpicking writers, because the writers they picked, like Gene, were not steeped in writing for westerns. It was not all over their resume that we've written, you know, 45 episodes of various westerns. They wanted Mm -hmm. a new perspective. Yeah, you know, I think that's... um, It was really smart for the showrunners to create a format that you can literally redress uh, based on the setting, you know, or the era that you want to tell these stories in, because they're not, at least from what we've seen, they're not really truly specifically about being Westerns. They're about being stories that happen to be set in the Western era. And it's not even really kind of like the, the 1800s early Western era. You know, this is kind of like, towards, you know, obviously the end of the Civil War, you know, a little bit past Reconstruction, and moving towards a uh, the less warlike, yet there is the Western expansion issue with the American Indians. Of course, that obviously exists. But it's not the savage West, I think, where a lot of the Westerns are based on, you know. And it allows more for, I think, just a little bit more experience you know, expansive, open storytelling possibilities. And something that I really found interesting about Gene's writing so far in all of his scripts, his level and attention to research. Now, let's take a look at who we're dealing with here in this episode. We're dealing with um, a very small yet very tight-knit Armenian family in the 1870s in California, why? It's a really interesting question as to why Gene chose these specific details for this episode. So as, as we are wont to do here on genealogy, we take a look at the details because it helps us inform uh, not only ourselves, but you know all of our audience as to the, the, the world building of what's going on here. So, you know, Earl, I love doing this. I love going into uh, research mode and... I have to just not just educate myself, but maybe educate those outside uh, of of what we do and and, uh, give a little bit more, you know, context of what's going on here. When Paladin is reading the quote unquote Central Californian paper, he reads and says that Selma Valley's Armenian colony today sadly canceled its annual wine festival. So I'm like, is that a real place? I mean, I'm from Southern California, but I don't know all of California. So I looked. And on the internet, it says Selma Valley is in the San Joaquin Valley in California, where our story happens to pick up after Paladin leaves San Francisco in search for Samuel uh, Abajanian. And according to the Fresno County Historical Society on valleyhistory.org, the article Armenian Settlers Come to Fresno County states, Armenia may be halfway around the world from the San Joaquin Valley, but for thousands of Americans of Armenian descent, Fresno County has been home for generations. Along the way, Armenians became leaders in agriculture and business, and their Fresno culture served as fodder for some of America's greatest 20th century literature. It began with an Armenian merchant, Hagop Seropian, who had settled in Massachusetts but found the winters were too harsh. In 1881, Seropian moved west to Fresno with his half-brothers, George and John. They found the climate and region to be similar to what they had known in Armenia. 
the Seropians turned out to be effective promoters. They wrote glowing accounts of the San Joaquin Valley and Fresno County to Armenian communities in New England and the home country. The Seropians began as grocers and then became packers of dried fruit. Their packing house was the first to ship oranges and figs to eastern markets and set the stage for a major American role in Fresno County grape, raisin, and tree fruit growing and packing business that would follow. Little side note, uh, Fresno County is the raisin capital of the world. So, and remember in this episode, what were the Abazanians crushing at the very beginning of the episode? You guessed it, grapes. So there's a little bit of tie in there in terms of the agriculture. Now, in a previous episode, Earl, The Hanging Cross, we have narrowed Paladin's timeline in this series to roughly between 1873 and 1878, give or take a year. So just in terms of kind of like the world building and the uh, the authenticity of what's going on here with this Abzanian family, I think it's it's uh, it's fair to say that there could have been a very tight knit group of uh, these immigrant farmers, very insular, very protective, very you know culturally defensive, here in you know the San Joaquin Valley in Selma, uh, especially someone like a Samuel as the patriarch, and I think that's. It's very realistic, even if it's a little bit of a stretch. So basically what I'm saying is, could that have happened? Absolutely. Absolutely based on the kind of like the geography and the cultural migration of the Armenians at the time in the 1870s. I wonder how much of a surprise this would have been to the average American who is somewhere in Ohio or someplace like that, who has not perhaps been to California and may not know kind of what the makeup of the immigrant community is there. And maybe that's kind of like where, uh, you know, your soft criticism of is that exactly how Armenians sound like, or is it just, like you said, the Russian accent, you know, uh, being based off of a Russian accent and so on and so forth. So is there kind of like enough authentic ethnicity that's happening in you know the Aborigines? probably not but again to the markets that are watching these tv shows it's better than not i guess does that make it excusable mm, that's debatable yeah there was one member of the cast who was actually russian born so i don't know if perhaps he could have coached them on the accent or if that was even attempted, because his family left Russia uh, when he was very young and then settled elsewhere in Europe and then fled to America. Very much like like any like immigrant family um, or immigrant culture, they're, they're harder to pin down, you know, or at least earlier on, you know, when they made the immigration to uh, the United States because uh, they didn't really, uh, they didn't, didn't really allow a lot of that. Yeah, there's that. There's a, also, yeah. there's a little bit fear of foreigners, um, and and it kind of like it was. It plays into the whole uh, ne- negotiation, you know, uh, issues with Paladin and and Samuel because they don't want to get taken advantage of. They know how hard it takes uh, or how how hard it was to get here. Uh, every penny counts, and even if they were incredibly wealthy, which Samuel was, you know, because Paladin says, look. I know you, this is the culture. You're negotiating for all of these different prices and all of these different like one-ups. But you have like a thousand acres of land. You have food that probably could, you know, it probably could rival some of the best you know, restaurants that I've been to in San Francisco. So let's dial it down a bit. You know, I'll respect your culture, but let's kind of like get things working here. And that's the thing. You don't just give away the farm. You know, you have to have these people outside of the culture earn it in a way, so that at least they know that they're sincere, you know, that they're, you know, that their offer for either marriage or business, you know, or uh, trading cattle, etc. That's a solid business opportunity for everybody. Well, especially for Samuel. He wants the, obviously the one up on Paladin, of course. And I realize there's something kind of antiquated about the whole honor system, you know, we are going to we are going to force this marriage to happen. I really think that Samuel as a character, as he is presented here, even as comedy-ready as the character is, 
I don't think he would have forced his daughter into anything that he felt she would have been mm-hmm. less than well served by. You know, if Jimmy really was some kind of both a cad and a bounder, I don't think the wedding would have been on. I think Samuel probably would have chased him off into the hills, rifle in hand, but I don't think Helen would have been... Yeah, l- like you could make Helen do anything she doesn't want to do. That's the whole plot of the story, and that's kind of what makes it funny. But I don't think, you know, from what we see of Samuel, that he would have said, oh, you know, well, this this has to happen mm-hmm. because tradition. I mean, there is an element of that, but I think he realizes by the time... He has heard some of Jimmy's ideas, and by the time Paladin has pointed out to him, and his own guys, again, have pointed out to him, we are hearing some good ideas here. I, I think he realizes that he has more to gain by adding Jimmy to the family than he does to lose. I mean, there's definitely a proving ground here, too. Yeah, Again, it's like with the negotiations, like, you know, prove to me that you know what you're talking about, and then we can actually talk about it, because now we're coming at this um, as educated equals as opposed to, you know, the the charlatan that's trying to one-up for the deal. But I'm glad you brought up the thing with Helen because that's the one thing in this episode I don't think we've really talked about, and that's something that's very, you know, subversively Gene, is that he's turning kind of like uh, the whole story on its head when it comes to the the battle of the sexes. I mean, now you have a headstrong maiden and a chaste cowboy. That's something that kind of spun the plot a little bit where we know that paladin is after both of them but we what we didn't know and was revealed very quickly is that helen is chasing jimmy and jimmy's like i don't want to be married i don't i don't really know what's going on here all i know is that i'm supposed to do the honorable thing which he really doesn't know what to do because he again i said earlier on in observations he has kind of more of this textbook a uh, literary version of romance, a la, you know, all the different poets, especially probably Shakespeare, Romeo and Juliet, etc. But that line that you said, the whole, there's a tornado inside me, and if it ever gets loose, it might tear us both apart. She laughs at that line. She's like, ha, a tornado, ha, like big man, put your money where your mouth is. Show me what a man's supposed to be. And when I watch that, I'm like, this is such a great role reversal on display here. It's like usually in the typical Western of this area, the man is usually like, you know, the chest thumper, the big bravado, and the woman's like the wallflower or the dutiful daughter or the wife, right? Helen knows exactly what she wants out of this situation and how she's going to get it. And Jimmy, like for all of his bluster and all of his, well, I know what a man's supposed to, you know, need and how a man's supposed to treat a woman and how a man's supposed to like take care of his, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He doesn't know anything. And Palin actually proves that to him time and time again with, do you know what love is? Do you know what a woman wants? Do you know what like all of the, like the poets and the, uh, all of the scholars say about the virtue of womanhood? And he's like, Well, you can drink, you know, you can lead a horse to water splash, right? Yeah. Dude, you don't know anything. Like, just calm down. We'll get you through this. So I love that she's already, Helen's already sized up Jimmy, knows why he's running, wants to bring him back because, you know what? He's not a bad man. He's an honest man. He just doesn't understand the way the world works. And maybe, maybe Samuel's like, you know what? He would benefit from a lot of being raised by a different perspective, you know, a a different type of culture. We don't get to see that, but that's where I think that this, uh, the resolution of the story is coming to is the future of this marriage. It's bright, but it's going to take a little bit of uh, negotiating, (laughs) I guess, for the lack of a a better term. So here we are, Earl, at the end of Helen, of Abizhanian. You know, the one thing that we actually never talked about, the obviously the play on the title, Helen of Troy. So before we get into what we usually do at the end of Mission Log Genealogy, when we take a look at, is there a message here? And uh, kind of sum up our discussion. Do you think that Gene was actually making... Uh, a parody of 
the Helen of Troy legendary title, the face that launched the thousand ships, the the woman that put, you know, two epic cultures at war with one another. In in some way, is he is he trying to just basically make a little bit of a pun on that between again these kind of culture wars that were happening with all of these negotiations between Paladin and Samuel and then maybe Jimmy and Samuel. Yeah, when you put it that way, maybe we're not two great cultures at war, but they were definitely butting heads over wine and kebabs. And so I I think there is something to that. The other thought that occurred to me, because I did have kind of the same Helen of Troy thought as I was watching the episode... The other thing that I thought of was this is a a much better slice of television than Elan of Troyes, but then so many things are. Fair, very fair, yes. I feel like the messages are really all spelled out in the show. There's not a lot of work for us to do here. There's not subtext to really dig into, except maybe in the cultural and historical sense. But there was something about the show that I found fascinating, and that is that I think most people think of the Western as a decidedly American genre, for better or worse. There is a book written by Kathleen Spencer called Art and Politics in Have Gun, Will Travel, the 1950s television Western as Ethical Drama. And in that book, the author brings up our old friend, the masculinity script, and how the increasing domestication of modern American life in the 50s left men yearning for some kind of adventure or outlet to prove their manliness. And the sudden late 50s glut of TV westerns crowding the schedule was an answer to that. Although it's really kind of, if you think about it, it's kind of a Madison Avenue, Madison Avenue answer to that. It's like okay, we can't really give you an outlet for adventure and, and you know, feats of strength, but hey, you could watch these westerns that are filled with commercials for our fine products. So I, I'm really just giving you a very compressed version of what she wrote in that book, and I encourage everyone to check that book out for yourself to kind of get the full measure of it. But I think there are some parallels here in that Jimmy is talking about how untamed he is. Uh, he is actually very tame. And so I think even though we are setting this story in the late 1800s, and it's about cowboys and ranchers and what have you, Jimmy is very much in parallel with the American male, the, the head of the American family, if you will, in the 1950s. He may talk like he's a tough guy, but really he's actually quite domesticated. If Kathleen Spencer's book is right, then I think it was a very interesting call for everyone, from Sam Rolfe and Herb Meadows, down to Richard Boone, down to Gene Roddenberry, to include stories advocating for nonviolent solutions. And here I think they're advocating for doing what Paladin has obviously done which is he broadened his mind with knowledge that served him well throughout this story. If you can't afford travel, hey, a lot of us can't afford travel. There's books. Dive into some. Do yourself a favor. Do the rest of us a favor. Paladin has obviously both traveled and read quite widely. And as this story shows us, that gives him the upper hand on every negotiation, every argument that happens in these 26 odd minutes. Richard Boone plays this with such a twinkle in his eye. But this time I felt that, you know, as opposed to previous episodes where Paladin seemed like a proxy for Sam Houston, I really got the impression here that the twinkle in Paladin's eye was the same twinkle in Gene Roddenberry's eye. Like we were really seeing Gene put a lot of himself into this character for once which really made me think there had to have been some Armenian negotiations in Gene's past, whether it was at the local grocery store or whether it was something that happened during the war. I have no idea. But so much of that was so very specific. It seemed like this is something that had to have really happened to Gene. 
And lastly, it's really fascinating that at a time when Americans were worrying more and more year after year about the Ruskies or the Commies or whatever, two different things. One is a cultural identity, one is not. But at that point, the government publicity and propaganda machine was conflating them into one and the same. The average person probably would not have been able to tell you in America the difference between Armenians and Kurds. And they would have made a snap judgment based on the accent. But here you have an episode of an American Western that at the very least encourages you to take on some more knowledge in that area. Be a bit more like Paladin, the man who can solve this whole crisis with words and not a single bullet. And by the way, fellow Americans listening to this, uh, this is still something we need to be working on. I had a question, though. I mean, I think that's a really interesting uh, aspect of, of the Western and the permeation of the Western, you know, in the 1950s, also obviously benefiting uh, the advertisers, you know, on uh, on the networks. Now, is it because of or in concert with the proliferation and success of the Western, which also allowed for the economy of scale when it came to sets, props, actors, wardrobe, horses, etc. So other shows like when it was at one time balanced between war, uh, you know, war shows or detective shows or police shows, the Westerns became far more, uh, again, proliferated and outstripped the competition because once they were successful, it's easier for the machinery to be maintained and also to grow from a production standpoint. So I have to believe that there's something involved there, too. Yeah, I mean, you had entire ranches that were not primarily ranching operations. They were there for film. Right, right. Uh, yeah. They were there entirely as filming locations. But, you know, they did have full-time staff on hand to maintain them. So perhaps they were close to being a working ranch in that regard. But most of these were filming ranches, basically. And also, you know, you kind of bring up the proliferation of shows like Combat. Mm-hmm. You know, numerous other shows that were basically telling us he, as Vietnam was starting to happen, these shows were singing the glories of the war that we had seemingly just finished. And you have to wonder if there were so many World War II shows on the air there for a window of time because there was so much surplus military hardware sitting around right. that had been retired from that war. And so, hey, authentic hardware... Let's stick a tank in West Point, but furthermore, you know, let's do a whole war show out of this. Mm -hmm. Safe to say that, you know, Hollywood's no stranger to being able to deploy surplus goods, you know, and probably have a fairly good relationship, you know, with the quartermasters of, you know, the United States military for for whatever reason, authenticity's sake, probably most. But yeah, I just it was just one of those kind of like uh when you when you said that and and when you referenced the book, I'm like, yeah. There were a lot of Westerns that were happening at the time, and obviously for very specific and, and, and very financially sound reasons. The other thing about this episode, which I really, really enjoyed, is, and here is something that's very, very on point, Gene, when it comes to this kind of story, this kind of subversive storytelling. There's a moment where Jimmy is tricked into staying for his own wedding banquet by Paladin, and then Jimmy says to Paladin, I mean, just because they don't do things like my people, that mean they ain't real down-to-earth folks, too. I mean, just because this Abijanian girl gets me, well, well, doggone it. Me, women don't chase men. Now, what I'm trying to say is that a man don't want a wife that chases him. From what you said, to what we've said in observations, to discussions, and now, I mean, how many messages can Gene fit into one episode? And in this specific case, one moment of dialogue. Jimmy reconciles the fact that the Armenians are good down-to-earth people. He accepts that he'd do things differently, and that is okay. But most importantly, he's uncomfortable with an independent, strong-willed, and unconventional woman who knows what she wants and knows how to get it. Right? This is quintessentially subversive Gene Roddenberry. And I would love to hear out there from, say, members of our audience that may have watched this episode in real time in 1957, what it was like to watch a 
headstrong, self-assured, you know, and uh, aggressive young woman who stole the spotlight in this episode and kind of turned the tables on this cowboy motif. Because when you really think about it from today's 2024 perspective, Helen is par for the course. But for 1957, I'm sure watching that was shocking. And in the real world 1873-ish uh, era, well, one could only hope that there was like a firebrand like Helen somewhere in the San Joaquin Valley stomping grapes and stomping cowboy chauvinism. Mission Log Genealogy is produced by Roddenberry Entertainment. If you would like to support us directly, you can do so at patreon.com slash mission log for early access to shows and the Mission Log Discord. If you have any material that might be of interest to us that isn't already in the Roddenberry archive, drop us a line at missionlog at roddenberry.com. Our website is missionlogpodcast.com. On the next genealogy, Ella West. Special thanks to consulting producers Matt Esposito, Homer Frizzell, Julie Miller, Mike Richards, Mike Shabel, Paul Shadwell, and David Takachi. We'll be back next week with more of your favorite programs. This concludes our broadcast day. This is a Roddenberry podcast. For more great podcasts, visit podcast.roddenberry.com.